All right. Welcome to another episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we welcome back Andy Norman. He teaches philosophy and directs the Humanism Initiative at Carnegie Mellon University. You may also know him from his guest appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast and the Michael Shermer show. He's also the author of Mental Immunity, Infectious Ideas, Mind Parasites, and The Search for a Better Way to Think, available now on andynorman.org. Welcome, Andy. Thanks very much, uh, Alan. It's, it's nice to meet you finally. <laughs> yeah, and so for our guests, right, this is Andy's second time on our show, thankfully. Um, so last time we weren't able to unfortunately get Alan involved, but thankfully we got everybody together here. Mm -hmm. So from what I remember about our discussion, we, are, uh, we pretty much left off. So we started talking about cognitive immunity and what the kind of structure mm -hmm. of, um, let's say, a disorganized system would potentially or you know could actually look like. And so the thing that I wanted to kind of start this discussion on and start to focus on is what sort of remedy would look like, right, or what remedies would be like. So I know we talked about platonic thinking too, you know, we mentioned the fact that with Plato, the idea was when you're constantly questioning, you're looking for these foundational sort of truths, right? So we're looking for the ideas that sort of found whatever we believe, right? Like, let's say the fact that there's a cell phone in front of me, you know, there's an Allen next to me, right? How do we know any of these things, right? It, you know, kind of epistemologically speaking. So we had these two schools of thought where in the Platonic realm, we're just constantly questioning and questioning and questioning, because we're saying to ourselves, we need to find the foundation of knowledge, right? Then on the other end, we have this other school of thought that's says, well, we can't know what these foundations are. So it's kind of okay to believe whatever you want. Right. And I want to read a quote from Andy's book on that. So right. Andy wrote, Andy wrote, the a, priori, the a priori method is similar to a libertarian regime, which I really love. I love the, the analogy there. And just as libertarian politics give free reign to exploitative agents, a libertarian ethos gives free reign to exploitative means. In the former, corporations exploit vulnerable workers. In the latter, ideologies exploit vulnerable minds. In both cases, a laissez-faire ideology prevents us from designing well-functioning markets. So love that. Um, so when we're thinking about these two kind of this dichotomous way of seeing, you know, uh, uh, let's say rational thinking or an acquisition of knowledge. On the one hand, we have, you know, platonic thinking, which is very black and white. It's either we know everything or we know nothing. And on the other hand, it's like, well, we can't know anything anyway. So we might as well just believe whatever we want. Right. So, but Andy, in your yes. book, obviously you have a kind of middle ground and a better solution for that, which involves the philosopher Socrates. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. So um, to, to provide a little context on this, um, in the same way that we can regulate our politics with sort of a, a, a blanket emphasis on rights to the exclusion of responsibilities. Now, many people recognize that as, as, as a libertarian. So libertarians take our freedom so seriously that they stress rights, but almost always experience responsibilities as infringing on those rights. Um, so if and if you just emphasize rights to the exclusion of responsibilities, you end up with uh, individual free agents infringing on the rights of other free agents. Now, libertarians know um, that you have to draw a line where other people's liberties come into play, but they don't always see the way in which responsibilities play a key role in in keeping us free. Mm. So so whereas a uh, a uh, sort of an anti-tax libertarian might think that, might argue as follows. Um, property rights are absolute. Taxation infringes on my property rights. Therefore, taxation is wrong. Mm -hmm. And now we can, we can yeah, I think a, a version of that exact same argument prevails to, and shapes our, the ethos we live in today. And it goes like this. Um, the right to believe what we want is absolute. Our responsibilities with regard to belief formation and belief maintenance infringe on those freedoms. Therefore, anybody who wants to advocate for our cognitive responsibilities is trying to infringe on my freedom of, of conscience, my, my freedom of belief. Right. Um, and so I think we happen to live in a culture right now that talks endlessly about speech rights and our rights to believe, our rights to our opinions, and talks almost not at all about our responsibilities. And what happens in a world like that is that crazy ideas proliferate, spread across the internet, infect minds, um, um, lead to many suboptimal outcomes, outcomes that actually end up uh, infringing on our freedoms in various ways, precisely because we don't take our cognitive responsibilities seriously. So philosophers go and 
back thousands of years have tried to figure out what does it mean to think responsibly? What does it mean to believe responsibly? And what are our obligations in that regard? Um, the idea at the heart of philosophy's attempt to uh, create an ethos where everybody takes their cognitive responsibility seriously is the idea that you should have reason, you should have evidence or reasons for your beliefs before you either rely on them yourself or run around asserting them so that others might pick them up. Right. Um, so in the book, uh, I argue that, you know, there's kind of a base level skepticism there, which is, you know, be careful what you rely on and make sure you have some warrant, some, some evidence, some reason before you embrace something. All of that's to the good, but it leads many to conclude that as long as I have a reason, that's enough. I get to believe it. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's crazy simple to generate reasons for anything you want to believe. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do when I, I can generate reasons for believing my political liber liberalism and you can generate reasons to justify your political conservatism? The two views are, are mutually incompatible but we each can generate reasons for our view. How do you coexist peacefully in a world like that? Mm -hmm. um, I argue that in the book, that the best way to sort of inoculate our minds against the crazy ideologies and conspiracy thinking that's running rampant through our world is to embrace a, a better standard of reasonable belief. Mm -hmm. And the better standard looks, looks like this. It's not, can I find a reason to justify this. That's not the true test of reasonableness. The true test is, um, can I address all of the objections that can be raised to this belief? Mm -hmm. um, if I engage in a hundred conversations with a hundred different smart people, and I try to field all of their questions, can I handle them? Mm -hmm. If so, yeah, go ahead, believe it. Go ahead, rely on it. If not, think again. Mm -hmm. So I call that in the book, I call that the Socratic uh, standard of reasonable belief, because it's basically, can this belief withstand questioning? Uh, if yes, go for it. If not, probably needs rethinking. Mm -hmm. I think if we all embrace that idea, we essentially uh, update our, our definitions of what counts as mind virus. So in the same way that your computer needs a new antivirus update every few weeks to keep from being vulnerable to the latest uh, uh, you know, antivirus uh, Viruses, malware. Spyware, malware, yeah. Mm -hmm. Malware, yeah, it's out there. In, this, in the exact same way, I think human beings need to update our mental operating systems with a new improved version of the Socratic method, the famous Socratic method. Right. And that if we do that, we can transform our world from one where we're, uh, where epidemics of unreason run rampant into a world where we can actually reason together, think things through, become wiser versions of ourselves and prevent cognitive contagion from tearing us apart. Right. And long answer to a short question, but let me stop there. <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, uh, sophistry is dangerous, right? I mean, uh, if you make a compelling argument, essentially you can convince people to come to your side right and imagine at scale at uh when you're dealing with masses of people what kind of thought proliferation is possible idea proliferation mm -hmm. and i mean that has potential benefits but it's also an incredibly double-edged sword right then it can become incredibly chaotic especially with the let's say the political divide in this country right, right? uh i mean i know there is more uh political um affiliations but in general usually it's the left versus the right yeah. and the momentum of that is is incredibly dangerous because then the, the country cannot unify on certain ideas right, right? we'll mm -hmm. always kind of be at odds right, right especially if we have like different reasons for why we believe something whereas like like let's say i have one set of criteria and then you have another and then we're like well my set of criteria is right and yours is wrong right so why would i listen to you right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i think in the same way that we can you know, discuss the merits of, um, I don't know, a carbon tax and together, and if we reason together well, come up with a better policy um, regarding uh, 
you, you know, the release of carbon in this in the exact same way, we can in principle examine the question: What standards should we being apply? Should we apply to our beliefs and our claims, and actually improve on our respective understandings of what those requirements demand of us? Mm. So, so philosophers like to engage in that kind of conversation. They're saying, well, well, what are the what are the correct standards <laughs> that we should govern our thinking? Yep. Um, and you can actually make progress on that. Quite. It's not just a matter of, oh, well, everybody gets to set whatever standards they want and then rely on them. No, mm. that's a recipe for, for uh, self-serving, wishful thinking and, and dissensus. And, and, and what would you say? Chaos, anarchy, right? right. Um, so we need shared standards of responsible cognition and there's a whole lot of really interesting work in philosophy that can help us converge on a well-functioning set of standards. And it's, we need that desperately in our society today because right now we've got the left relying on one set of standards, the right relying on another. You've got libertarians are relying on a third set. Right. Um, and uh, it's really, really hard to have constructive political discourse. Uh, constructive dialogues in a world like that right and it's yeah right so essentially we have to ask is are these I, like for example if there are certain ideas that i'm espousing right um let's say from the left perspective i have to ask are these ideas true can they withstand scrutiny um are there any holes let's say in uh my argument uh is there any merit to this other side's argument right um, how can Right. How can I integrate all of this information, sort of come out with a, a better perspective, maybe unlearn some uh, things that I've, I've mm -hmm. held to be true that maybe aren't actually objectively true. Right. That's right. right. And, right. Then, and then, Andy, from your perspective, what do you feel like? How did the standards differ on each political on this each side of the political spectrum? Like, is it that you feel as though or you believe that people are relying on authority figures, which is why we have different criteria? Or is there something else going on, too? Mm. That's certainly certainly part of it. Um, and psychologists now know that people will bend their political ideology to serve their, to, to protect their identity. Mm -hmm. so, so if you grow up in a conservative family and you identify as conservative, and then some people come along and argue that conservatism is morally bankrupt or something, you get defensive, right? I mean, we all get defensive when our identities are challenged. So, uh, one of the morals of this is that try not, we should all do our best not to hitch our identities to controversial political views, because chances are pretty good that those controversial views are limited and limiting. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, um, and if you want to be able to dialogue in an open and constructive way about your own ide core ideas, if you want to keep learning and evolving your, your, your core commitments, you can't hitch your identity to them. At least you have to go in for the weakest form of, uh, you, you know, go, go in for a gentle, kind of weak form of identity that's, that's uh, eager to um, part with any ideas that prove to be limiting. And what do you mean by that? What's the difference between limited and limiting? Um, yeah, let's see. So I guess I, I think it, an idea can only capture part of the truth. It might be limited in that respect. Mm -hmm. And it would be limiting to the extent that your rely, our reliance on it would limit our possibilities, our, our opportunities for flourishing. Right. So limited would mean less than the full truth and limiting would mean actively harmful of our, prospect, of our prospects in some way. Right, I love that. Right, and if we reacted to every like for example in terms of cognitive immunology right our uh, to protect our own beliefs or our ideas will sort of form these uh, uh so to speak antibodies right to sort of protect these ideas but mm -hmm. it it's as you say it's it's limiting because then are, are you really aiming for truth right. or do you want to just keep confirming the ideas that you already have and try to assert them right that, that's exactly right alan and uh I, I only came to this formulation after finishing the book, but I actually think that doubts are the antibodies of the mind. Mm -hmm. And when they're functioning well, they, they dissuade you from over-reliance on things that are 
objectively or genuinely questionable. Mm -hmm. Genuinely problematic ideas deserve less than full devotion. And when doubts pop into your mind and say, I'm not so sure about this, maybe we shouldn't rely on this too much. That's your mind's immune system working properly. But when your mind's immune system starts generating doubts about whether the planet is genuinely spherical, (laughs) if your doubts start lead you to become a flat earther, your mental immune system has gone haywire. It's attacking the wrong things, right? Mm -hmm. It's generating doubts that are causing you to doubt things that are genuinely solid and not doubt things that are genuinely dubious. Right. But wouldn't we say in each case, doubting is a good thing as long as it's based in reality? I like that caveat, right? So a lot of philosophy, uh, a lot of work in epistemology, the branch of philosophy devoted to how we should think, um, is, is, is loves the idea that everything is, is open to question. Right. Um, because any hint that something might not be questionable seems to sanction dogmatism, closed-mindedness. Mm-hmm. So philosophers from time immemorial have said, let's question everything, question everything. In fact, you've seen liberal bumper stickers that say mm-hmm. question authority and question everything, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, kind, I, I can see the why you're drawn to that view. But I also show in the book, based on, on years of research, that the impulse to question can go off the rails. It can become hyperactive. So imagine a questioner who basically said, okay, what's your reason for that? And you give them a reason and, and they just say, okay, well, what's your reason for that? And you give them a third, re- a second reason. And they say, well, what's your reason for that? And they just keep going until you give up. Have they really won the argument? Mm-hmm. Or are they just being like this metronomic, using a, f- a simplistic childlike formula to try to defeat any claim at all by, by simply raising boring, generic why questions? Right. That's interesting. That's very interesting because, yeah, I suppose um, I'm, we don't have to stay on this, but I guess if we tied it to, let's say, uh, COVID, right? right? Um, mm. Maybe maybe somebody might question, oh, uh, why are all the why are there all these uh, vax, vaccine mandates? Let's mm. say they start to inquire. They begin with that inquiry. And then maybe they get an answer like, well, um, not enough people in society are deciding to get it. We'd like to make a a shift where a certain percentage of the country, let's say 70 percent, gets the vaccine. We get the economy going. We don't have um, the supply supply chain affected. And you give that response. But let's say they're not um, satisfied. They think uh, enough people like they they might have some counter argument that uh, just supports their not wanting to get the vaccine. And they start to question that and they keep going forward and forward and they might look for ideas that support not getting actually now i have a little bit of an incomplete thought there i thought i was going somewhere with this well let let, let me let me pick up on that because i think you're i I like where you're headed with that think about this idea that vaccine mandates are part of an attempt to take over our lives and deprive us of our freedoms so so this is this is a meme that flourishes among anti-vaxxers and and many people on the conservative right, they're, they're really worried that big government is going to come s- steal their freedoms. And so when government comes along and says, hey, we have a vaccine, it can make you healthier. Um, we want everybody to take it. Uh, you know, here's a year when you can come get it. Um, and they finally end up saying, no, not, not enough of you are getting it. Uh, now we're going to consider vaccine mandates. Some people are just so uh, conditioned to believe to be suspicious of the government that they jump to the conclusion, oh, this is an attempt to deprive me of my freedoms. This is a, a power grab. Well, look, nobody gains power by inviting you to come in and, and uh, boost your immune system. No, no, nobody's getting more powerful as a result of that. So the, the whole story just doesn't add up, right? I mean, this is something that's costing the federal government ton of its political capital, a ton of its financial resources, and they're not gaining anything. These are well-meaning people who actually are trying to help us. So, so the, the basic story that circulates among anti-vaxxers here and convinces them to avoid the vaccine just doesn't hold water. You, you can look at it closely and it, it just falls apart quite quickly unless your mind is so full of other conspiracy theory and and kooky ideas that it seems to fit in with all those other ones. 
Right. Uh, imagine, let's say somebody um, says, oh, well, what about this conspiracy? This particular conspiracy is real. Uh, for, I, I'm just going based off memory on your appearance on uh, Rogan. I think you used uh, Enron or the Gulf of Tonkin as, a, as an example. I think Enron or right. something. And then he's like, oh, well, that was a, that was a real conspiracy. Yeah. Well, imagine somebody says, well, there was this real conspiracy. So conspiracies are real. They actually occur yeah. in reality. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I'm not crazy to think that the government wants to do this or that. And then they start building from there and as opposed to doing what you would recommend, which is a sort of rigorous idea testing. Right, right. Why is this true? Yeah. And, and, and think beyond uh, what you want to confirm, right? That there, there may be other right. reasons why um, authority figures want m most of society, to, like why, why would they mandate the vaccine? Right. Maybe that's, that's the only way to get enough people to do it. Maybe people are scared from the pandemic. Right. Maybe if you're that high up in government, you have to think, what do you have to do? Like, well, yeah, it's for choices? the community, right? Like, mm -hmm. what, what's best for the community? Because in some sense, right, it's, it, by the way, here's the thing, Andy, and I think you kind of see this, and I'm sure you just see this too, right? It's so interesting when we think about the government, we think about it as being disconnected from society. It's like, mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, well, they're protecting themselves also by protecting the community because, you know, if we're all vaccinated, guess what? These people in government are fucking alive too, right? But it's like, right. no, 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 they're somehow separate, right? It's like, no, they yes. wouldn't want to do that, right? They have these nefarious reasons, but it's like, no, they're self serving as well as community serving because like let's say uh, joe biden if he's like you know the shadowy figure or whatever i don't know who would be in the dark government let's say joe biden is the leader right um yeah sure. he wants to live too so he doesn't want a bunch of unvaccinated people around him i mean that doesn't make any sense yeah well i mean so when um when benjamin franklin left the constitutional convention after the articles of confederation had been drafted somebody asked him well what is it sir what kind of government do we have and he said a republic if you can keep it right. and the you there meant this is your government right. you are the, um the government we are the government of the people by the people for the people right that that's lincoln's language but the idea behind america is that we we govern ourselves here and that our government is our our, our representatives to defend our interests and when a populace feels that its government is its agent and doing and doing its best to help it. It's generally a pretty they bring bring a pretty cooperative attitude towards the things government tries to do. But as soon as the government starts seeming like it's other and and uh, it's not us, it's them and them. They're trying to take over, right? And so for about forty years, conservatives have have gained political power in America, have gained political power by demonizing government. Government is the problem, said Ronald Reagan. Um, and ever since then, um, uh, Republicans have run against big government as though big government was this, as though Democrats wanted government to be big. It doesn't. We don't. We Democrats don't. As though we want government to take over our lives and deprive us of our freedoms. Trust me, conservatives, we don't. We Democrats don't want that. Um, so, but by fear-mongering about government, conservatives have effectively created, driven this massive wedge between us, Republicans, and government itself. Government mm -hmm. is the, has become the enemy. And once you regard it as the enemy, you're immediately suspicious of any, anything it tries to do, and your, your doubts start to run away from you. That's, that's the kind of a hijacking of the mind's immune system for political power. Right. Right. And even going now back into kind of Socratic questioning, right? So the thing I love most about it is like, you know, you always have like these people who will always say, why, 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 why? Because it's an easy way to win an argument, right? So when you think about, I guess, foundational truths, what was so interesting in your book is when you mentioned, you know, with Plato, that there's this sort of a kind of like bedrock that's unquestionable, right? So in order for us to have logic and in order for us to like know anything, really, we have to have these certain unquestionable truths, right? So can you tell us about the Socratic kind of spin on that? Or you rather even your yeah. spin on that, right? 
right? Because I mean, in some sense, there are these unquestionable truths, but there's actually a really good reason for why that is. It's not that like, uh, you know, this is just some, you know, kind of axiom of the like universal axiom. It's, I, I want to kind of let you answer it, right? But why isn't that the case? Why isn't it that the, yeah, these absolute truths aren't just like these metaphysical truths that Plato kind of, you know, uh, let's say conjectured about? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked about that because not many podcasters and uh, media folks want to go this deep into the philosophy, but I'm, I'm thrilled that you do. Um, so, so if you hold that we should all be able to question each other's ideas, which right. seems like a really good idea, then for any given belief I have, you can say, well, okay, well, why do you believe that? Okay, fine. I give you another reason. But in principle, the same, the same principle applies to whatever reason I give. So you're allowed to say, so it, it would appear that you're allowed to say, well, okay, well, what's your reason for that? Mm. Um, so, so, but where does it end? Right. So th this is a problem philosophers call the regress problem. In any argument, what, what are the starting points of a solid argument? <laughs> and, and what makes the starting points or the, the premises that you start your reasoning from anything other than arbitrary, given that you're not also arguing for them? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Mm. Um, in other words, um, what, what can function as foundational or right. basic in our collective belief system and in our uh, when, when we're talking about genuine knowledge as opposed to mere opinion, what are the firm foundations upon which real knowledge rests? So this is, this is a longstanding philosophical problem. And it looked as though for about 2000 years, it's looked as though there have to be basic assumptions that nobody can question. Otherwise the bottom falls out. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And this just for our audience, right? This goes back to the Descartes idea of I think therefore I am, which is why I know anything in the world. Right. Descartes was trying to dig his way out of a skeptical. So he, right. he'd actually raised some really radical questions about whether we could really trust anything we believe. And then to rescue himself from his own hyper skepticism, he basically had to say, I think therefore I am. At least I know that. Right. Let, mm -hmm. Let's see if I can rebuild all of knowledge on that one slim foundation. Mm -hmm. So I think therefore I am was kind of like an axiom in the system that Descartes constructed. And if you're not familiar with the concept of axioms, mathematicians will often say, all right, here's four or five things that look just completely obvious. Let's see how many conclusions we can generate just relying on those five axioms alone. Right. And they generate entire systems of geometry and mathematics based on often small sets of axioms. Mm -hmm. Those axioms function as kind of unquestioned starting points for the ensuing mathematical uh, system. Now, so philosophers have long assumed that knowledge generally must have axioms and that the characteristic quality of an axiom is that it can't, be, can't reasonably be questioned. In my book, I argue that we actually need a somewhat more subtle understanding of what what beliefs function as basic mm -hmm. i argue that if we don't want to sanction dogmatism or unquestioning acceptance of axioms then you have to be able to ask questions about axioms also right but how do you do that without just making it a free-for-all mm -hmm. right where where questioning just corrodes everything and the answer is that there's a, a class of a, a very large class of beliefs and claims in our lives that are effectively immune to bear, well, why do you believe that questions? But they're still wide open to the kind of questions that might take on the burden of disproof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a lazy questioner who always just asks, well, why do you know that? But somebody who says, you know, that's really interesting, but I'm not too sure about it because here's two other things or three other considerations that make that problematic. That's a far less lazy form of questioning. Mm -hmm. I think that we should regard the axioms of knowledge as having this kind of standing where they're reasonable enough on the face of it so that the burden of disproof is on the challenger. Right. Mm. But that doesn't mean we have to hold, hold them immune to creative questions or challenges that might pop up. Mm -hmm. Do you see how that might work? So it, it, mm -hmm. it stops the, the endless search for foundations, right, right. But, but leaves us with something that's not arbitrary because it can with the, the things at the basis can withstand questioning 
even though the question, well, why do you believe that doesn't even arise? Right, right. And just to kind of like reframe it in more layman's terms, would this mean essentially that this foundational knowledge is knowledge that's been like one ages ago, right? Like, let's say vaccines are safe, right? Like, that's something that pretty much, let's say 90% of people accept, right? So it's like, if we're going to the foundation, so first we're questioning, okay, uh, you know, COVID vaccine, how do we know that this vaccine is safe, right? Then we kind of go under and say, well, you know, we know that other vaccines are safe. So it's really likely that this one is too, because it's sort of building on what we've already known and the kind of information we already have about vaccination creation, right? But then the question is, well, how do you know vaccine? vaccines are safe, right? And then you would kind of flip it around and say, why would you doubt that? Because this is such a well-established truth. Is that it? Right. Exactly right. Um, So so there's enough historical evidence that vaccines are carefully made and that they've uh, uh, benefited humanity. So that for my part, I'm likely, I attach a certain amount of credibility to any claim about this next vaccine is will probably be helpful. I, I tend to give that a high probability yep. in, in my in my first guess. My first guess is that this new vaccine they're coming out with is probably helpful to me. Now, other people who are more suspicious, of course, attach a much lower probability to the thesis that, the, that this new COVID vaccine is genuinely helpful as opposed to, say, a government plot, whatever. So for me, the claim this vaccine is, is a good thing is what I call presumptive. It's, it's reasonably likely feel free to raise objections if you like, but right now I'm not seeing any of them stick. What, that's what I see. Other people, of course, live in uh, internet rabbit holes where people are raising thousands of questions about these vaccines and they're so hyped up on, on skepticism and uh, doubt that they continue to attach low probability to something that is objectively likely to improve your health. (laughs) Right, right. Right. So it's like we're going from like this vaccine is safe, right, to all vaccines are safe. And then how do we know that? Well, I mean, we've already have like years of research on this. So it's like, why is it that this particular vaccine would be so terrible for you, as opposed to these other vaccines, which are obviously very similar, which have been relatively safe for us and obviously have helped us, you know, in terms of like the wider health of the community. Plus, you can add that um, certain authorities like the FDA or other groups that um, approve certain uh, phases of a of a vaccine, or they approve it for public uh, use. They're, they've approved other things before for public use using their uh, their guidelines, essentially, right? 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 Yeah. And we've trusted those vaccines. So why don't we trust this authority? to, you know, to make this choice to approve this one, right? And also on that point too, right? When has the FDA ever approved anything that's been harmful to like the vast majority of people? Somebody probably might have a count. Like, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I've i seen it also in one of those internet rabbit holes. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, somebody probably will have an answer for that. Mm-hmm. But still, regardless, the probability, again, that the authority is not making the right choice here is, right, is right. lower. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then yeah, now we're then talking about bigger picture, right? And how many times has the FDA actually done that number one? And then how many times has there never been any sort of a correction for it, right? If there was some sort of acknowledgement that that somehow has happened. True. Right. There, there was an interesting example in the paper the other day. This is, I think you'll see the connection here. Uh, some employ, some, em, some employers introduced vaccine mandates. Mm-hmm. And some employers said, no, I'm not going to do it. And, I, and they filed for a religious exemption. So mm-hmm. based on my strongly held religious beliefs, I, 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 I don't want to take this vaccine. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have to take this vaccine. And so they sat down with these people and they asked them, well, why? Why, why don't, why, how does this violate your religious beliefs? And they basically said, well, because the vaccine was developed using fetal cells. So, uh, Basically, a lot of medical research now is done on stem cells originally derived from a uh, from a from a fetus from right. from an elective fetus, and this proved to be a convenient excuse for not getting the vaccine mm-hmm. for a lot of people. And word was getting out: oh, all you need to do to avoid the vaccine mandate is claim a religious exemption and and call attention to the fetal cell the use of fetal cells. Right. Um, and say that I have a moral and religious objection to this. Um, and so a very creative employer, according to this article, basically went out and checked and, and he tried to figure out which other medications were developed using fetal cells. And it turns like, like ibuprofen and aspirin and, you know, like, like things that everybody uses every day. 
right. um, were also have the same strike against them. And so he created this interesting little questionnaire saying, are you also, are you also ready to give up all these other miracles of modern medicine? Because they were developed by fetal cells too. Right. And there were a few ardent religious believers who basically said, oh, if those were developed by fetal cells too, I'm prepared to give them up as well. Because mm -hmm. their belief that anything based on the use of fetal tissue is wrong was genuinely religiously rooted. Okay. Everybody else was like backpedaled furiously and came up with another reason why they should be granted an exemption from the vaccine mandate. Mm -hmm. well, it was what, clear what, they what were the, just... Sorry, what was the other one? What, what was the other one? The other what, one, I'm sorry. The, yeah, the other reason. What did they come up with the second time oh, around? Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, you know, some of them fell back on, uh, well, I just... I believe in a free society where where I get to make my own healthcare decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think there, there were the reasons were various, mm -hmm. but it's interesting when when your worldview, when your core beliefs or the, your fervent beliefs um, are supported by by things you grab onto just for the sake of supporting that belief. Um, and you're not actually revising those beliefs when you know sensible questions to them are raised. Right. It's a pretty clear sign that your worldview has become rigid and ideological rather than flexible and coherent. But I mean, if you don't know learn how to question your beliefs and modify them based on what you learn, your belief system will become more brittle and more uh, arbitrary and more incoherent. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of forgotten the art of collaborative idea testing and belief revision, which is at the heart of philosophy. And in part because our culture has disdained philosophy as a useless hair splitting exercise for so many uh, decades now. Mm -hmm. um, just not many people have a taste for the kind of conversation we're having right now, the kind of conversation that um, really gets you to think deeply about things and revise your worldview so that it can stay current and, and stay healthy and flexible. So if we can bring philosophy back into vogue, if you guys can bring philosophy back into vogue the way you're trying with your podcast, yeah, that might yeah. be the solution to the our problem, right? Yeah, that'd be really great. No, 100%. I mean, um, this is kind of a working idea, but I was hoping that if it could somehow be established or sort of made understood that if we allow, if we don't try to question why our ideas are true, right. especially in the age of the internet, the age of these uh, 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 internet uh, wormholes and rabbit holes, and, and in terms of um, certain ideas gaining momentum and just people fervently believing them it's either to belong to a tribe or to a, a group. I mean, imagine what that momentum can do if you don't try to do something to, to sort of stop it, because mm. it's not just chaotic. I mean, on one, on, in one sense, chaos is fair, but in another sense, it's also, I don't know, it's, it's very dangerous for society, right? If uh, imagine a really dangerous idea became popular and enough yeah. people got behind it. And then that ended up making huge shifts in society and to people's daily lives. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's incredibly important to question why certain things are true and to see the nuance, right. And, yeah. and not to identify and become, you know, become your ideas and defend them mm -hmm. to the death. Right, right. right. Getting that's, that's yeah. ego, you know. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. I was about to actually just piggyback off of that with that term, right? So yeah. we kind of see that oftentimes, right, the person's like ego is involved. So what I found to be helpful, like for us on our podcast, is so let's say I'm having a conversation with somebody about why vaccines are safe, right? So I'm not an expert. I'm, you know, not an epidemiologist or virologist. It's not what I do for a living, not my training, right? So sometimes when I get into an argument with the person, it kind of feels like the other person is like, oh, I have to outsmart him, right? So what tends to be helpful for me is so we have. Had, um, Dr. Jonathan Berman on 
Mm-hmm. And he's a full on expert on like vaccines. Uh, he wrote a book called anti-vax, like pretty much how do you kind of talk to anti-vaxxers and what's been helpful, what's not so helpful. Right. So mm-hmm. what I do is I say to them like, oh, you know what? I actually don't know. Right. So these questions that you have for me, I'm sorry, I'm just not smart enough to answer them. This is not my field. So when I tell them something like, hey, you know, we had this expert on because we had the same questions that you guys do. So sometimes people are like, oh, shit, now this is not like a like a combat or a rivalry. Right now, it's not I have to defeat you and kind of prove my point to you. Now it's like, you know, you pretty much know almost as much as I do, whatever, give or take somewhere in that, you know, dimension or whatever. But now, like, we could kind of go to this other person and look at this together. Actually, uh, sorry, yeah. and I, I know, yes, yeah, so you actually facilitate uh, uh, hard co- uh, conversations uh, mm-hmm. between people, right? Uh, at yeah, Columbia, that, no? yeah, that's right. Every week, um, for 10 years, I did it practically on a daily basis. And now I'm doing it once a week with a group of students that likes to explore difficult and deep issues in kind of a collaborative way. And so it's critical, I think, to healthy thinking that you not do it in a combative way. Right. So, so the moment you start using reasons as weapons and shields to just defend your point of view to the death, you, you stop learning. The conversation becomes unproductive and rancorous and you know culture wars form and deep divide you lose friends over that um what you do is you approach a really interesting complex question like so this this next coming week my students and i are going to discuss the ethics of abortion and Mm -hmm. some of our members are liberal some are conservative some are religious some are secular and because we practice the art of of reasoning respectfully and listen really listening and learning from one another i mean the liberals in, in in this group called the humanist league they listen to the conservatives knowing the conservatives will draw their attention to parts of the complex truth in ways that enrich their perspective. Mm -hmm. And the conservatives in our group come willing to listen to the liberals because they know that the liberals will call attention to things that enrich their perspective. Um, And I think this is the spirit that all inquiry, all dialogue and all learning and all thinking has to take place. The Mm -hmm. moment partisanship turns that constructive conversation into like a, like a battle, that's the moment where thinking starts to go downhill, mainly because our mental immune systems get triggered and start treating reasons on the other side as threats. Right. Right. And, and it goes back to that um, idea earlier um, of holding your identity loosely, right? right. I mean, I, I feel, uh, this is in my experience, when uh, the times that I can, you know, as much of a percentage of the, t- I'm not perfect with this, of course, but um, anytime that I can hold my identity loosely, I, I try to think this person is not so different from me mm. what, or, or, or they're not different from me, right? Why, why is it that they believe what it is that they believe? What, what are their reasons, right? It, it, do I have to necessarily ascribe them to just being uh, wrong and I'm right, they're the other, this and that, or is there, some kind of reason what maybe there's something that led them to that path of thinking if i could understand what led them there maybe they're going to be open to what led me to maybe my path of thinking and maybe we can then integrate right that's exactly the right mentality to bring to these things and and your your instinct there alan to you know listen and learn try to understand how how the other person came to their perspective and and give them a chance i mean ask clarifying it's almost always a good idea in these difficult conversations to ask clarifying questions first, before you assert anything, just kind of ask the other person, give the other person a chance to open up and explain their thinking Mm -hmm. and just patiently sit there and listen and learn, exemplify a willingness to learn from them. And then when you finally do come around to the point where, where you get to share your point of view, they're ready to listen to you and learn from you because you've demonstrated that you're, you're willing to learn from them. Right. That's good. That's good practice. And it's critical to good to good dialogue. I'm curious, um, when you're facilitating these conversations, is there any particular um, structure or, or maybe sort of a loose structure that you um, would sort of uh, make you, the people participating sort of um, follow mm-hmm. in, in the sense of, let's say, um, I'd, I'd like you all, you know, when whenever you're giving a feedback to someone, uh, maybe restate what they stated to show that you understand or like something. a procedure like it, yeah do you have a procedure or, for- or, 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 or ground rules or something yeah, right yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. um we try to keep the rule set set very slim 
-hmm. And we rely more on just the power of our example. So there's me and a small set of student leaders who facilitate these things. And just in the way that we set the tone in the first few minutes and the way we participate in our first time. So there are a couple of rules like um, uh, try to limit yourself to one point per turn. Mm -hmm. um, be succinct so that other people get a chance to have a turn too. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then, and don't, and, and then really listen to what other people have to say. Um, sometimes, you know, we have people raise a hand to, to get acknowledged and then they get a turn and a, and a moderator decides whose turn it is. Uh, but every once in a while, there's kind of a cue. There's a bunch of hands up and people are waiting. And so we have the option of doing a quick response, which is where you, if you really have to say something about what the last person said and you want to jump the queue, keep it to two sentences. Mm -hmm. but, but it's really more a function of um, just exemplifying intent, listening, maintaining a respectful tone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I do think it's really good practice, Alan, to basically say, you know, I hear what so-and-so was saying with this, and I think that they've got a really good point, and I acknowledge that. And I also think this is an important part, piece of the picture. Yeah, you're familiar with the, uh, somebody, I think in the design world, recognized that when they were trying to collaborate to design something really cool, somebody would come up with a crazy idea and somebody else would say, no, 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 but, or, you know, that's okay, but, and then the but would precede something designed to tear down the original idea mm. or to diminish. And in fact, the use of the word, but almost always means I'm, yeah. about, to, I'm about to diminish the thing. Yeah. Um, if instead you teach everybody to say comma and like, I hear what you're saying, Leon. And I think this is a piece of the truth, truth also. Yeah, that's it creates a so much more constructive ethos, collaborative ethos. Right, so right. if you can unlearn the tendency to say no, 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 or blah, 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 but, and instead just say, I hear you. I think you're onto something there. I'm not sure I'd express it in exact, exactly the same way, but I like what you're driving at here. Here's how I would put it. Mm -hmm. Right. And you don't trigger um, the things that they're identified to, right? It, it becomes, you're very careful about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it also reminds me of Danny Kahneman, right? When he asks his students, rather than tell me what's wrong about some proposition, tell me what's true about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Catch somebody doing something right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you kind of get this, especially like on graduate level, like, uh, well, on college campuses. And I mean, it's also happens with undergrads too, but definitely in the graduate levels, right? Where you pretty much have this idea that like, we have to defeat one another, right? It's like, if somebody brings up a point now, it's like, oh, let me show you why mine is better. Well, and I got to say, you know, philosophy grad school is like this on steroids. Like mm -hmm. you're trained to, to tear other people's arguments to shreds, right? And I came out of grad school ready to tear arguments to shreds. And I went into teaching with that same modality and man, students hated it. Right. I had to completely overhaul my approach to running a good classroom discussion in, in order to make everybody enjoy the experience and get involved and feel engaged. And it, it started with... Um, um, yes, there's a look, good idea. Testing has a competitive element. Mm -hmm. You really are testing it with counter examples. You really are testing ideas with objections and challenges, but it's gotta be done in a collaborative spirit underneath the competition is a, is an underlying cooperation. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's just investigate mm -hmm. this thing and, and deepen our understanding. Mm -hmm. that's something we can both do at the same time and we can grow together, become wiser together. And sure, sometimes I'll, it'll turn out you're wrong. Sometimes it'll turn out I'm wrong. More often, it'll turn out that we each have a piece of the truth, but we both need to sharpen the way we say it. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's that saying, right? Uh, there's three sides to every story, your side, my side, and the right, truth. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, I like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Out of curiosity, um, is it through teaching that you sort of developed this this mentality, or did something else sort of happen that led you to um, this way of sort of nuanced thinking and appreciating other perspectives? Yeah. Well, so I taught critical thinking for a lot of years, and right. there are a whole there, there's a whole genre of textbooks on critical thinking, and they basically teach you how to ask tough questions and to dissect arguments and identify their flaws. Right. 
But you can see how that might create the same kind of combativeness that leads conversations to go downhill. Right. Right. So I became aware pretty early on that the traditional approaches to critical thinking are very limited. And in fact, they kind of are somewhat distorted by the idea that it's important to be skept super skeptical, super critical. Like the more critical, I mean, who wants to hang out with somebody who's critical all the time? Mm -hmm. Nobody, right? right? And so we've got courses trying to teach us to be more critical. Meanwhile, your friends at home are saying, quit being so damn critical. Mm -hmm. right? People feel the push and the pull of that and they end up adopting and they and they get frustrated about how do I integrate critical thinking in my life and keep all my friends. Right, right. So I'm advocating for an entirely new approach to, to critical thinking and critical thinking instruction that doesn't put being critical front and center. Mm -hmm. And I think the way to do this is to basically say, hey, look, our minds have filtration systems, idea filtration systems, and they're supposed to weed out the falsehoods and the bad ideas. And they're supposed to let in the truths and the good ideas, but they don't always work properly. Let's figure out how they really work using good science, come up with a science of mental immunity, understand why mental immune systems, how they work, why they fail, and how we can make them work better. Um, and in the process, we can take critical thinking to new heights. Yeah. I, I'm, I, in the process of writing the book, I came to realize that what we're doing right now to inoculate people against bad ideas is a drop in the bucket of what's possible. Mm -hmm. Imagine a future, a generation or two down the road where people are, 85% more resistant to bad ideas. Mm -hmm. Imagine how much better a world that would be. Right. Imagine yeah. if, the, if our, if our um, taste for divisive ideologies was reduced by 73%. Mm -hmm. How much more constructive would our national discourse be? How much more constructive would politics be? Mm. I think these are achievable goals once we have the science of mental immunity figured out and we begin to apply it to the design of our institutions and our practices. And when ordinary people take it to heart and just conduct themselves in their ordinary everyday conversations in ways that are aligned with, with good idea testing practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, if, if everybody on this planet spent 10 more minutes a day um, applying basic core principles of cognitive immunology to their, to their conversations, we'd, we'd eliminate billions of bad ideas from the meme pool every, like day in, day out. Right, right. Yeah. I, can, Andy, can we talk about the research institute that sprung from all of this? I'm so happy you asked. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so basically, after I published this book, mm -hmm. I started sending copies to some experts in what's called inoculation theory. Mm -hmm. These are people who go out and say, how do we, what do you have to teach somebody so that they become less prone to climate denial? Right. And they go out and they come up with a little article and they give half of their test subjects this article and the other half a, a control article. Mm -hmm. And then they test them afterwards to see how prone they are to climate denial. And it turns out that certain interventions, certain uh, instructional um, experiences can increase a mind's resistance to certain kinds of bad ideas. Mm -hmm. This is called inoculation theory. And um, uh, sorry, where was I going with that? Um, uh, yeah, so the Research Institute. What's oh, the Research Institute. Right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So I started reaching out to these people who've been doing this fascinating research, and they were mm -hmm. like, "That what you want to do, Andy, sounds really important. Mm -hmm. I'd like to affiliate with your your institute." Right. Right. Um, basically half a dozen to a dozen of the top researchers in the world who are working on working out the foundations of this new science are on board. We've got funders coming up and saying, we want to support that. And the nonprofit research institute we founded is called the Cognitive Immunology Research Collaborative. Mm -hmm. Circe for short, mm -hmm. C-I-R-C-E, like the Greek goddess. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think uh, within, if we, if we get the funding we need, we will chart a path to herd immunity to cognitive contagion. Wow. Imagine humanity one generation down the road 
where epidemics of unreason don't just run rampant through the populace and and divide us against each other right my institute i i like to think will lead our lead us to that future yeah, that's so amazing, man. And then, so, I mean, I have to ask, right, did all of this kind of snowball after your appearance on Rogan? It did. Uh, mm-hmm. My book launched the day I went on Rogan and, uh, you know, I started hearing from people right away. One of the people I heard from in the early days basically said, I want to, su- I want you to do a research institute and I want to support it. Mm-hmm. And, and his found, founding gift is, is going to, going to take us pretty far. And uh, we, we need more support so we can do everything we want to do. But, um, but yeah, the, 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 the affirmation and the people who get this concept mm-hmm. and see its potential have been really enthusiastic and it's, it's been very gratifying. Yeah. And it seemed like, like Rogan was also pretty sympathetic to it. He seemed to have like really been open to your ideas too. That was really cool. It is. I, I, I developed a lot of respect for him in the course of our roughly three hour conversation. Yeah, uh, I'd had many people warn me. Oh, you know, Joe Rogan, he's 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 not going to agree with you on a bunch of things. Turns out he's become a really really good listener, and he's really good at finding common ground and gently exploring ideas. I think he's become a a, a quite a skilled con- conversationalist, and uh, I I really like his approach to to exploring ideas. He part of what he does is explore. I had some ideas that are out there a little bit. Gives them airtime to give them a, gives them a chance to breathe and test them a little bit. I mean, that's one reason. I mean, my, my ideas are somewhat might say a little out there, <laughs> and he gave my I, he, me a chance to to voice them and and gave us a chance to explore them. Um, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, I like that he's providing a a forum for sort of narrative changing. You know, yeah, ideas to, to flourish. Um, not all of them are gonna gonna survive, and not all of them should survive. Right. But I really like what he's doing. Yeah, and then Alan just went to see him last night. Oh yeah, um, in Madison Square Garden. Actually, I got the yeah. tickets about uh, two years ago, but then due to COVID, it was postponed. And yeah, they rescheduled it to yesterday, and it was I think my first time. I think, haha, it was my first time <laughs> at Madison Square Garden. And the place was huge. Lights wow. everywhere, these huge screens. Uh, so many people, I think 20,000 people or uh, over 20,000. So w- w- was this a comedy show? Yeah. 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 Comedy show. Okay. Because he's a comic, a uh, mixed martial arts announcer. Mm-hmm. He has got this Podcaster. podcast with a, yeah. hundreds of millions of followers. Versatile. Yep. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, it was an incredible experience. The crowd, just the energy of, of the people going crazy when he came out and, and him leaving and him saying thank you to everyone. Mm-hmm. It was it was awesome. And then obviously I was laughing. It was a great time. So, yeah. Yeah. He yeah. really connects with people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, my understanding is that a lot of men like his show mm-hmm. and he's I mean, the, I mean, the guy is a uh, muscle bound beast who's you know ripped right and and he does mixed martial arts he, i mean he used to be a mis, mixed martial arts fighter i think and now he's an announcer so he's nobody's idea of a pansy mm-hmm. and yet he explores ideas in sensitive ways where he really brings a capacity to listen and learn and i, th- and I think he's serving as an admirable role model for many men you yeah, know absolutely that way. Yeah. And what's really cool about Rogan is that when he brings like somebody like you on, right, because Rogan does come from the alternative movement. I mean, that's like a fact, right? This is not even, you know, this is not a secret, right? So when he brings someone like you on, what's so great is that, you know, when he has these alternative thinkers on, people are very quick to latch onto those ideas, but then here you come and people are like, oh, wait, maybe we're wrong. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And and Rogan said during our podcast that when he, that when he first started podcasting, he produced stuff that he nowadays he can't stand that it was combative right it was combative and he he got defensive right and he didn't like the way he sounded he realized he was not coming across as wise or compassionate or insightful he was coming across as belligerent in some ways wow. so he actually revised i mean to his credit right he kind of revised the way he conducted this podcast and he actually learned how how much you can learn if you bring a more cooperative and open and exploratory mindset i think he's he's kind of jacked his mind in his brain into the internet with his joe rogan experience and he's learning like through a fire hose and uh man the guys the guy's got 
we can all learn a lot from him, even if he brings Alex Jones and some nut jobs onto his show from time to time. <laughs> For sure. I mean, yeah, uh, right. I mean, that that could be things that let's say people would use or let's say uh, or clickbait articles, things like that, in order to sort of um, uh, maybe give him a bad name and not necessarily look at the nuance of, of maybe who he is as a person. I mean, I have a friend, uh, one of my best friends, uh, he thought because he gave a platform, technically speaking, to uh, Alex Jones, that's that's wrong because you have such a, a huge audience. Why would you expose them to this person? You have some um, semblance of control over how you conduct your show. And I thought, okay, my friend had a point there. But then the thing is, uh, he kind of then dismissed Rogan too, which kind of sucked from my perspective because I, I like to think of Rogan as like he'll he'll sit down with somebody even who's controversial and try to do this attitude of. Let's find out what's true together, as well as listen. So yes, he he'll listen to somebody too, and maybe they'll say something controversial. So fair I, enough, I, he may be quiet, but yeah. I, I feel the pull of the of the argument that it's morally questionable at best to be giving Alex Jones a bigger platform. I mean, I mean this guy has peddled hate and division and conspiracy thinking just to get rich, right. and when when brought up on charges that he was defaming people you know he testified under i'm just an entertainer you know i'm 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 not bound to any standards of honesty or responsible uh talk because i'm just an entertainer and i mean it, the guy clearly operates in bad faith in order to get rich i mean he's, he's manipulating people's mental immune systems with highly seductive ideas right. that captivate people's imaginations and warp their thinking right. and he's getting rich off it i mean if you're an alex jones follower he's he's playing you Right. Yeah. And it, I, I wish that people like Rogan recognized that and said, you know what, our culture would be a lot healthier if guys like that did not get so much attention mm -hmm. and stop yeah. inviting him. I, I think that would be the more responsible thing for Rogan to do. But um, I haven't had a chance to have that conversation with Joe. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, I mean, I guess at the very least, he kind of questions the beliefs and he'll actually call Alex out on the show. And I'm, by the way, I'm not like a Rogan fan. I think he's cool. I mean, Alan's the fan here. So this is not even necessarily me defending him. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, but I, the episode that I did listen to him with Alex Jones, he pretty much, he would call him out and he would say, no, no, that's not true. And he would ask Jamie to look stuff up. So I respect that. I was like, okay, if you're going to have him on, at least fucking call him out. Like, don't just have him on and be like, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds like it could be legitimate. Fair enough. And, and again, I haven't listened to his shows with Jones, so I don't know the specifics. And it sounds like if he's doing that, that's that's uh, I, I approve. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. All right, man. So it's a great show. It literally feels like we went on an odyssey for the past like hour or whatever it was. So yeah. Alan, final questions before we go, man. Oh, yeah. Um, and if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, uh, where could we find you? Yeah, thanks for asking. So I, I hope you'll uh, well, my personal page, andynorman.org. It contains a lot of references. You'll learn more about my book there and uh, and my my work. Uh, you, there are links to a lot of podcasts like this, radio shows. Uh, but also, I hope you'll check out if you're interested in this idea of cognitive immunology and the science of mental immunity. Check out cognitiveimmunology.net. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the website for Circe, and uh, we're, we're very eager to hear from people who want to support work like that. So. And where can we find you on social media? Um, I'm a somewhat inconsistent okay, <laughs> yeah. social, social media. I, I do have Andy Norman author a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, actually, there's lots of lots of stuff there you can. Yeah. And we can also find you on uh, Dr. Andy No, D-R-A-N-D-Y-N-O at Facebook. I mean, not on Facebook, on Twitter. At Twitter. Oh. That's, that's correct. Yeah. All right, Andy. Um, yeah. yeah. Guys, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolutely, man. And thank you. So, like, this was just awesome, especially as a part two, because there was a part of me that was like, oh, man, I wonder if we'll be able to pick up on the first conversation. I didn't even feel the time. I don't yeah. know what time it is right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you so much, man. This was really great. And I hope, obviously, whenever you have another book coming out, you'll come back on. Thanks, guys. Um, let me know when when you when the show drops and I'll I'll spread it around on our uh, with, with my with my following. All right. Absolutely, Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Take care. All right. That was awesome. One of my favorite shows. Well, guys, if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram. And at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Like, subscribe, hit the hit bell. The bell. <laughs>
And thank you so much for watching. Again, this is the book, Mental Immunity. Uh, check it out. It's, it's amazing. It's helped me. It's helped Leon. And I think it's going to help a lot of people. So thanks again and see you next time.